I'm looking at basically is uh, revenues and expenditures. expenditures. Then, so those are above the line. If below the line, it would be other financing sources. Those would be below the line. Yeah, so so cash expenditures would be below. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, as, as another financing source, it's so correct. Capital expenses. Expenses. Uh, like capital expenses. Expenses. Uh, you the it's part of your expenses. Right. Well, so it's departmental expenses and then, yeah. Is that what we're, what Chair has referred to in an earlier discussion where we're talking about the general fund operational expenses within the budget, you know, police department, the human resources. Oh, okay. Yes, oh, yeah, right, okay. As an operational expense. Okay. And then we have revenues that come directly into the general fund. And then if the general fund wants to make a transfer to the capital projects fund to fund future capital projects, okay. it would do that as a transfer, transfer which is you know, not a general fund operational expense. Okay, okay. okay. agreed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Oh, uh, for operating transfers, yeah. Yeah. Right. just below that line. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, we'll get into this a little later. Do you have anything else? We'll excuse you. Um, yeah. uh, that's it. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get 10 minutes lumped on the other end, right? Yeah. You take 10 minutes off. Oh, yeah. You need to do a speed walk. 10 minutes shorter. Okay. Now, um, would you like to go into the uh, bill? Is this your uh, yep. item 5? Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, this is going to be a three-hour uh, discussion <laughs> cut down to 30 minutes. Um, my suggestion is that in light of that, um, I've discovered giving this presentation to a number of other committees, the longest extender of time has to do with questions. So if you're going to, if there's any really, really, really burning question, then go ahead and stop things. But otherwise, um, wait till afterwards. I'll certainly, I'm always around. I'll be around tonight till seven or eight, um, and um, there's an awful lot to go through, so I'm gonna just go throw it out there. First of all, the city council just passed a new resolution that governs, establishes and governs town committees and commissions. Um, resolution 13-08. I happen to have a copy of it here, and if the city manager hadn't jumped the gun and ripped me out of my office to come to this meeting at 2 o'clock instead of 2.30 as it shows on the agenda, I would have had copies for all of you. We all, we have I don't. Oh, good. We have copies. Good. Um, so yeah, we have let me, copies. Couldn't we assume that we've all read it? Yes, I assume you've all read it. So what you haven't, what you haven't necessarily read totally is the fact that, that this um, starts off the, the very first thing that it says, the principles and rules, are that you have to follow the city council rules of procedure, which is um, somewhat n not exactly a, a big deal. The Atherton Municipal Code relating to your own subject matter, which I didn't bring today, I don't, I don't think that's a problem. And then the California Open Public Meeting Law, the Brown Act. Um, the Brown Act, I'm gonna jump right into, um, is basically California sunshine law. Everything that you do or we do as a city has to be done in the public eye with very, very few limited exceptions, none of which will probably ever apply to this committee. So with that said, what does it mean you have to do? Well, first of all, you have to have um, an understanding of what it is that, that complies with the Brown Act. Every legislative body, including committees like this one, and any subcommittees of this one that are standing committees. So for instance, if there were some reason to have a subcommittee of this group review the annual audit and make a report back to this committee, if it was a standing committee, meaning it's one that's going to be every year we appoint somebody to it, then it is Brown Act compliant itself. If, however, the chair appoints two people to simply look at this year's audit and come back with a report, that becomes an ad hoc committee and it is not Brown Act compliant. I know it's confusing. Um, ask the city clerk or the city uh, attorney if there's any questions. So then, what's a meeting? A meeting is any congregation of a majority of members of this committee at the same time and place to hear, discuss, or deliberate upon any item within your subject matter jurisdiction. Sounds really simple, right? You can count to what you have a quarum of five, you have five people, so you have a quorum of three, right? You count to three, piece of cake. It is absolutely anything but that simple. 
If in fact you all run into each other at the grocery store, and there's three of you at the grocery store, and you look at each other and say, hey, what about that audit? Or don't you think we ought to change it this way? Guess what? You have just violated the law. In fact, if you do it knowingly, it's a crime. Um, it certainly is something that if the Fair Political Practices Commission that administers things like this got a hold of, they could find you, and they would love to. Um, now, we as a group are very careful about not violating the Brown Act. And that says that anytime you have a meeting, you have to comply with a whole bunch of provisions. And so this concept of what constitutes a meeting really is the foundation for it. Obviously, anytime you get a quorum together and you discuss your topic, then that's a violation. But what if there isn't a quorum in the room? Everybody can leave the room except for Greg. And he and I will have a conversation about something that should be done to improve the way you, you operate or some issue within your subject matter. If Greg then comes back into the room and talks to Bob, who then talks to somebody else, and the next thing you know, that idea has gone around the room, that violates the Brown Act. It's called a serial meet meeting, or a seriatim meeting, or a daisy chain meeting. And you can't do through intermediaries what you can't do by having everybody in the same room. So what the Attorney General says you have to do is if the chair wants to talk to uh, any one of you, or even a member out in the public about something that's before this committee, you're supposed to say, excuse me, have you talked to any other members of the committee? And if they look at you in wonder and say, where did that come from? You probably have your answer and you're okay to talk to them. If they look at you and say, well, yes, I actually, I, I've talked to so-and-so. Now you have a problem, potentially, because if so-and-so has talked to one other person you now have a quorum of the body that's discussing an item in your subject matter, and that's a violation of the Brown Act. So it gets really complicated, and when you ask city attorneys, we give you this advice. Um, don't ask anybody else on the committee anything, because assume that they've talked to somebody else, and you're supposed to be asking those questions right here. Um, if you have a procedural question, like, are you available to meet next Thursday? That's not talking about something in your subject matter jurisdiction. That's a process question. That's OK. Um, you can all contact the city manager or the city attorney or your finance director and ask a question about something. That's OK, too. But you can't contact Robert and say, hey, Robert, poll the other members and see how they think about this issue. Because if he does that, then every one of you has violated the Brown Act, except for Robert. How's that for escaping, escaping the, the punishment? So you have to understand, the punishment is members of the body that are meeting, even if you don't know you're meeting with other members of your committee. So that's a big caveat. There are exceptions to that. The individual contact exception is, any one of you can meet with any one other person to discuss something within your subject matter. But as I just said, they write the big word, however, make sure you don't develop this collective concurrence with other members inadvertently. Um, I don't know how you can do that. It's virtually impossible. So I say try to avoid, I mean, look, you have this meeting, you have all this time to, to fill, um, fill it with meaningful questions and dialogue and just save it from outside this. You can go to a seminar or a conference, even if all of you are there at the same time, but you're not supposed to discuss town business, um, and it, it usually doesn't give, it, the, the, the opportunity doesn't usually arise. There's usually a set uh, educational component and they're gonna teach you. But I have seen questions where even with 300 city attorneys in a room, somebody got up and asked a question, and others, in the, in the room included their, some of their city council members because they all go to the annual league meeting and there was um, some question as to whether or not it was appropriate for the city attorney then to have members there to where they could get to a collective concurrence. So you have to be careful. There are people that care about this stuff. Um, there's a community meeting exception as long as that meeting is open to the public and publicized. The question arises from time to time, you know, sometimes that's a, a local chamber of commerce or a neighborhood group, what if they charge an admission fee? As long as the admission fee is not outrageous, um, they could probably get away with it if it's just to cover their expenses. 
but if, if it's a neighborhood fee and they charge $250 to get in, probably not open to the public. Um, you notice I'm going really fast and skipping lots of stuff. I'm really just giving you topics to think about. There's a social or ceremony, ceremonial exception. So um, I, a lot of the boards and commission members come when new city council members are sworn in. Good, you should. It's good, good to meet your, uh, your new bosses. Um, at the same time, you can't talk about your own committee business at that meeting, but you can go and have more than a quorum there. It's okay as long as you don't talk about your job. Um, all meetings of the committee have to occur within the boundary of the local government agency with some exceptions. We talked about serial meetings. Um, I don't care about that. Um, fellow members. Uh, now, um, every meeting, you notice, um, it's really handy to have a notice, uh, an, an agenda, right? Um, that, that isn't really provided for your convenience. It's provided because it's required by law. The Brown Act requires it. And it does a couple of things. It tells you the time and place of the meeting so that the public knows they can come and come in here and, and not just listen, but participate, as Nancy said. And it also gives you a roadmap for what it's okay to talk about. Um, as a general rule, you can only discuss items that are on the agenda. Now, if it's a special meeting, which is one that's called outside the normal, regular meeting time and place, that meeting, literally, you can only talk about what is on that agenda. Other agendas give you the right to add things that came up after the agenda was posted if it could not have been contemplated that this would be something coming forward at the time the meeting was posted. Can't do that with a special meeting, and that makes sense because special meetings, you only, call, you only have to call them 24 hours in advance. Regular meetings, the agenda has to be 72 hours in advance. So um, it's there as much to give you a, and the public some kind of a notification of what you're going to be talking about. Now, we try to draft um, agenda items in very vague uh, mm -hmm. ways on purpose, for regular meetings especially, so that you have a little bit of a leeway. Um, you know, I, I noticed uh, Greg raised a, an issue about talking about uh, uh, the, the city's um, investment policy um, under the auditor comments. Well, wait a minute, it's not on the agenda. It doesn't say anything about investment policy, does it? So could you have talked about the investment policy? The answer is you could have asked the auditor about the investment policy, but you could not have gone into a general discussion of the investment policy with staff and all the members of the public that are lined up to listen to this discussion. That would be inappropriate because it's not on the agenda. And you will hear, especially at city council meetings from time to time, either the town referee or members of the commission, especially the mayor who's well versed on this, you'll hear people say, you know, we're getting a little off the agenda. And you need to get back because the law is very clear. You can only talk about agendized items. So, it, and there's a recent case out of the Merced County where, long story made short, they got to pay the attorney's fees for uh, an attorney that challenged a planning commission decision and then before the planning commission could get the board of supervisors to revise it and cure the so-called violation, the, the, the people that objected at the planning commission level filed a lawsuit that it ended up in a, uh, uh, an appellate court decision. So I'm guessing probably a couple hundred thousand dollars, that little, little tiny mistake cost the county of Merced. And everybody knows counties have lots of money so we have other ways to spend hours than fighting these kinds of silly mistakes. Um, so um, the staff will be handling your notices <coughs> and agendas with some exceptions. And I'll go through the rules, um, just very hit, hit, hit some highlights about how items get on agendas. Um, There are a few exceptions to discussing non-agenda items, but my attitude is, if you don't have to, don't do it. And if you do need to do it, check with the city clerk or the city attorney first. 
And that means if you're in the meeting and somebody wants to talk about something that's not on the agenda, if I'm the chairperson, I say, time out and contact the city clerk, city attorney, or even the city manager who's very well versed in all this to get a ruling because the consequences are you get to do it all over again if you even sort of violate the Brown Act, um, let alone the potential criminal actions. And by the way, just in case everybody looks over their nose at us, it's criminal. Has anybody ever been prosecuted criminally? Yes. That it had, the mayor of Seaside was the first one, and there have been as recently as last year, I'm told, prosecutions for violation of the Brown Act. So, Really, the biggest violation is if you read about it in tomorrow's newspaper and it embarrasses you or it embarrasses the, the town, then you know the, we're doing something wrong. We need to fix it, and that's kind of what this is. This kind of indoctrination is about. What about public participation? Um, would it have been okay when I walked in to talk to you to tell the auditor and the cameraman to please leave? You're not city staff, and we're now going to get a, a legal briefing. The answer is absolutely not. This meeting is open to the public for all reasons and purposes unless there is a valid closed session uh, excuse to kick the public out. Um, giving legal advice, generally speaking, is not in and of itself grounds to kick the public out unless it is regarding something that could lead to litigation actually threatened or something that is, in my opinion, fairly obvious that it could lead to that, that end result. Um, so um, you're not going to be kicking the public out um, probably ever. So if it comes up and, and, and you get to a point where it's an issue and you're thinking about it, my suggestion is call a timeout and, and either speak to myself or the city clerk or the city manager. Um, what about limiting the public's comments? Um, well, today that wouldn't be a problem, but you never know. They may show up. It's very common to limit the time, such as three minutes is sort of a common one. I don't think you can limit it to 30 seconds. Um, sometimes I wish you could, um, and this speech may be one of those times. But um, you can also limit the overall total time. Um, probably not going to be a big thing here. What about management of the meeting and decorum? Well, that's up to the chair in, to, to, in, to invoke these rules. Please understand that anybody that wants to can come in here and be critical of you, this committee, the town, and the staff. They have an absolute right to do that. However, that's where the line is drawn. They may not criticize other members of the public. They also may not be slanderous. Now, that slander is a legal term, and unless you are one, you probably shouldn't be practicing law without some kind of advice or counsel. Um, there's a difference in being rude, obnoxious, direct and to the point, and, and, and telling an absolute false lie intentionally in a way that could impact somebody in a negative financial way. If I were to say, you know, Greg, I, I, I saw Greg the other day with an underage prostitute and he was giving her large amounts of money and they look like city checks. Now, I'm pretty sure that's false. In fact, I know it's false. But if I were to make that comment at a public meeting like it were true, that is slander and you can stop somebody from being slanderous. You can say, whoa, time out. You may sit down and leave the room if you're going to keep talking like that. And it, it is within the power of the chair to do something just like that. My suggestion is, if somebody is out of line and gets irate and irrational and is ruining the meeting, call a recess to the meeting and ask the person to leave. If they won't leave, have the body itself adjourn for 15 minutes and everybody leave. And then, if the person still is here, walk across the street, get a police officer come over and ask them to leave the meeting, they're no longer welcome because they have disrupted a public meeting. And it has to be a pretty serious disruption to get thrown out. Um, that's why a timeout is a good idea and come back and see if the person is willing to now play by the rules. Um, after a closed session, you have to reconvene. I'm not too worried about a closed session. I do want to talk a little bit about conflict of interest laws and that will go really fast. The Political Reform Act of 
1972 or 4, whatever it is, has three sections in it that you should all be aware of. Um, there's a conflict of interest provisions under the Political Reform Act itself. That little Form 700 that everybody files every year, um, well, that's the state of California making sure that you don't have a conflict in anything that you're doing in here. The committee members, they don't do that, do they? I don't know. Should committee meeting? Uh, I thought that they did. But most, 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 most cities don't have audit committees like this. Um, but quite frankly, they probably should be look, looked at as being able to influence financial policy. And because of that, because um, you make a recommendation. Have so, you ever done that? No. No, but you should we'll make sure that that I, I, will, I will be right up front with you. This is the only town that I've ever seen in the state of California that I've worked with or for that has had extensive use of committees the way the town of Batherton does. Okay. And because of that, there's a possibility of influencing a decision that is that le could lead to a conflict of interest. Please note that whether or not you fill out a Form 700, you still are held to the same standard of not having a conflict of interest. Okay, um, and that's pretty important. Um, there are three areas that the Political Reform Act says you cannot. Uh, you have to disqualify yourselves from making, participating in, or attempting to use your official position um, to influence a government decision in which you know, have reason to know, or should know that you have a financial interest. Um, now, there's a complicated seven-part test. It has to do with, you know, it's much easier in a land use decision because you can say, well, you're within 300 feet of something. But for instance. If you are going to make a recommendation on the town's investment policy, fortuitously came up today. If you made a recommendation that, for instance, I think you should look more into um, certain kinds of, uh, of an investment uh, vehicle, some kind of a bond or a piece of paper or whatever, and you just happen to be a bond broker that sells those kinds of things, you ought to have a big red flag raised because even participating in suggesting it to the city council that then tells Robert go enter into a contract is enough to violate not just their conflict, the, the, the political reform act conflict of interest policy, but also something out there, the third branch that is really, really sneaky and ugly called government code section 1090. The city attorneys affectionately refer to it as the death penalty. Because if you participate in a contract at any level, including making a recommendation that somebody in the agency, somebody in the agency execute this contract with a vendor in which you have a, a financial interest, it is a felony, punishable by more than a year in prison, not jail. Secondly, the contract itself is void, not voidable, which is very common language, but void, meaning there's no discretion, it's dead. And any benefit that you might have received, you have to give back, but the town gets to keep whatever you have given them in return. Um, and again, um, the easiest one is a land use decision. If a, a case in Southern California where um, a city councilman had the best piece of property to establish a government facility on, so he sold it to the, the, the city that he, that he was a councilman on, and he voted on that action to do so. So he had to give the money back, the town got to keep the land, and he was criminally prosecuted. Strike three, death penalty, we don't go there. So in this area, if there's any way that you could have any kind of a financial interest in something you're recommending, any policy you're rec recommending, you need to consult the city attorney or the, the city clerk. Now, everybody goes, I hold stocks. I hold stocks in the company, and the company is one that Robert tells us he's investing in. If it's a Fortune 500 company, there is a test that says if you hold less than a certain percentage of shares, which is pretty much everybody on the planet, but you never know in Atherton, um, it could have been a company you started. So um, the bottom line is we have to make this bright line test. We have to hold it up and see if you need to disqualify yourself. Now, if a disqualifying event is found to occur, 
You cannot participate at any level. You can't talk to staff. You can't talk to your fellow colleagues. You can't talk to anybody except maybe the city attorney to find out if you're disqualified. And once you're disqualified, every time the matter is brought up, you have to leave the room and not sit here and make any of these gestures that could influence the voting of, of everybody else left behind. If the person leaves and it means, or maybe there's a couple of people, if that means there's less than the quorum, the meeting has to stop at that point. If you, continue, you can continue the item to the next meeting and perhaps somebody who's absent will be back and make a quorum. Otherwise, if it's clear that it impacts enough people that you're never going to get a quorum by waiting, then the, by rule of necessity you get to draw lots, straws, dice, cards, um, random number generated table. You get to bring people back until you have a quorum. And that person votes as if they've never been disqualified at all. Okay? Now, that's conflict of interest laws in a huge nutshell. Um, the rules that the town, uh, the city council has just adopted. First of all, um, you have a department that's been as assigned to you as a liaison. Um, it's the finance department, strangely enough, and Robert is has designated himself, but he could designate somebody else in his office to be your liaison. That person is responsible for the agenda being right, and to a certain degree, I hold them accountable for Brown Act compliance. If they feel uncomfortable or they feel there's a problem, I, I, I hold them to be accountable, to, to raise their hand and say, time out, we, let's talk about this, and here's why. Um, how do you get something on the agenda? Well, there's four ways. City council can direct staff to add an item. The city manager has sole discretion to schedule an item for your agenda. Um, routine items can be put on by your staff, or two committee members can prepare a colleague's memo. Notice there's no place in there where I said any of you get to decide what's on your agenda. There is a bit of leeway there. It does say that the um, that, that a committee member can ask the city manager or a council member to uh, suggest an item go on the agenda. Um, I would think it would go like this. The chair, you would funnel your request to the chair. The chair would talk to your staff person. Your staff person would talk to the city manager. And I'm going to tell you the way it really works is about 98.9% .9 of the time that item miraculously appears on the next agenda. Um, what you can't do, you can't walk in and direct that Robert adds something to the agenda. Why? Because Robert is not the city manager. The city manager controls the agenda, period. The city council doesn't control the agenda other than if they put something, they can put something on by directing the city manager at it. Um, that's what happens when they get the big bucks. Oh wait, no, no. no. Um, so that, that, that's the only ways that things are supposed to make it onto um, the agendas. The city clerk has overall responsible for posting agendas, and we'll do so. Now, what about advocating? I mean, you guys have more knowledge about the city's finances than almost anybody else except council members, and maybe the city manager and finance director. Certainly have a lot more than me. Now, does that mean you can go out in the community and advocate on behalf of this committee? And the answer is no. But more importantly, what about appearing in front of the city council to tell them what you think of what's going on at this committee? Well, interestingly enough, that this committee can vote to have one representative, or what usually is the case, the chairperson, goes in front of the city council and says, this is what we have done. Or you communicate in writing through staff um, by making recommendations, because you have no authority to do anything else other than advise and make recommendations. You don't buy, sell, build, or any of those other verbs. You recommend and advise. And so um, you, it, it specifically says members shall not present opinions of their own committee or commission at a meeting of the city council or otherwise unless you have been authorized and directed to do so by your committee. For instance, Greg's the chair, so normally he would appear at the city council meeting. Suppose Greg's on vacation. He can appoint somebody else at your meeting. You know, you can, he can appoint or you can vote to send somebody else. 
um, to the meeting, and they can um, weigh in. Um, a couple of items, even though it is here in, in writing, uh, you have to be a registered voter in the town. Interestingly enough, if your voter registration were to be changed to another community, even if you're still living here, there is a problem there, by the way, a legal one. Um, bottom line is you have to resign your position, and you do serve at the pleasure of the, the council or until expiration of your term. Uh, terms expire in uh, on, in June 30th. So anybody whose term expired last month, he shouldn't be here. Um, uh, you can serve only no more than two, two consecutive terms, then you have to leave for two years. Um, this is all new. The city council representatives here, there are two of them. One's a primary liaison, one's an alternate. Um, going forward, they will not vote. They're no longer a voting member. They are a liaison, and basically they're here to hear what you think, what you have to say, and not to try and um, persuade you to, in any way, look at their point of view. Other than they can certainly participate in the discussion, but they're not supposed to. Uh, the, the fear was that, well, when the council members vote, people then start going, oh, gee, I don't want to disagree with them. They appoint me, and no. The whole concept here is for citizen in interest in this and, and citizen points of view and in this case, um, experts' points of view. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the, there, there should, in the future going forward, and, and there is kind of a cutoff date somewhere, I don't remember where it is, but there should be uh, one person from the city council here, one will be an alternate, and they probably won't both be here at the same time. So I'm just going to uh, make one little correction. I think mm -hmm. that what we decided is that for yeah. this committee, that um, both uh, council members would be the primary and they would not have alternates. Unless otherwise directed by the council, not just the mayor directed. Because we both really wanted to be here. That didn't quite make it into it, your resolution. It, yeah, it did. Where is it? Well, it's it's under. Um, we, just, we really wanted to hear the Brownite lecture. One more time. Yeah, yeah. 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 One, once more. <laughs> I, it was the fastest I've ever given it. Anyway. It's um, pretty good. Uh, if you're going to be absent, you have to call the chair or your staff person because if you're absent twice without calling those people, you have automatically vacated your office. Um, Is that twice in a row or twice over the top? Consecutive, two or more consecutively scheduled meetings, two in a row. Um, the, chairperson, <laughs> the chairperson shall be voted in July um, and the council members shall not serve as chair or vice chairs. Um, How about page four, Bill? Unless otherwise directed in section. In the first paragraph, the last sentence. For each committee or commission, unless otherwise directed by the council, one city council member shall be the primary, right. one of the alternate. It may have been directed by the council, but it didn't make it into the resolution, is what I said. And so I didn't know that. Even though I was at the meeting where they talked about it, I don't remember what they said. Well, I think you are focusing on something else. Probably, yes. <laughs> um, I, 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 it hasn't been a problem with this committee, but with some other committees, it has been a problem, so I just want to highlight. Um, you, you, it, you, there's a statement in here about, about your capacity, your powers and duties. Um, I'm going to summarize. Make recommendations, consult with the city manager, act in advisory capacity and make recommendations, provide oversight, advise the city council, and review. There is nothing in there beyond those words that you have authority to do. Um, so I would... I would Leave it to your wise discretion and comments and thoughts of fair play. And I know that if there are any questions, you can certainly ask them right now. Oh, Time's I've up. used my 30 minutes um, almost exactly, which was a world's record. And um, I am certainly available after your meeting if you have any questions too. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate your beautiful New Year's Eve. Just yes. enjoyed it. I like that cut down version. Yeah. Well, and, and something that, that, that I will also tell you is the city staff has developed yeah. a handbook that's about 95% done, and once it's done, we will hand it out, and it has a lot of this information in it, um, and, and more, because it's really got a lot of stuff for the city council, too. But once we do that, then it will cut down on a lot of these briefings, because people will see them. It'll be a lot more reading, because it will have the purchasing policy in it. 
the Brown Act and its uh, Code, form, of ethics. Code yeah. of Ethics, Rules of Procedure, and then all other uh, Yeah, I didn't talk about parliamentary rules of procedure because, quite frankly, at, at this and level, rules, it's rules of procedures yeah. that we're using. Yeah, and, and it gets. And the book would be small enough to fit in the Yeah, no, no, it's a binder. <laughs> and, and I look at anything you do is just a recommendation, so I'm not too worried about somebody suing us over. Not being parliamentary, parliamentarianly correct. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, item six, uh, George, are you or uh, sure, I'll take that one. Robert will sort of chime in as as we go. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, as the mayor articulated earlier and the vice mayor articulated, we have an adopted budget uh, adopted by the council in June of this year. And when the council adopted the budget, part of that was a recommendation to the finance committee that they provide a recommendation back to the council on what to do with the town's general fund unallocated balance, which is above and beyond our basic reserve. And the three points that were articulated within the staff report, part of the budget adoption was three options. You know, contribute toward the town's pension or other post-employment benefit liabilities, which in that case is health insurance, retiree health. Or two, contribute toward capital projects or three, uh, make some modification to the town's reserve policy, or do all three of those in some way, shape, or form. So you have before you the staff report that kind of outlines that. We talk about uh, the town has about $9.2 million of balance at the end of the year, and that's broken down into four components. One is the 15% uh, emergency reserve, and you have a copy of the town's reserve policy in your packet. The second is the 20% unassigned reserve, that's about $2 million. The third part is the building con department contingency fund, about $411. And then there's an OPEB reserve, which staff has put in there as part of the budget, which isn't a, an allocated part for council policy, but it's something we're talking about when we're talking about contributing towards a pension or other post employment benefits. So that amount is set. Beyond that, there's another $4.8 million that's unallocated year end. So the options were pay down pension or other post employment liabilities, increase the mandatory reserve policy, or do something additional toward the town's capital projects. And talking about the pension and OPEB liabilities, we're a page you go with respect to the OPEB liabilities and paying our minimum, minimum required contribution, which is about 620000 or so. Some of that is for historic employees, retiree health care benefits, some of that is for current staff.